We all know that uh, Canada has earned some bragging rights in uh, recent years through the repair of our previously dire fiscal situation and the strength that that has imparted to our economy. We have the largest share of our population working with any Western industrialized country. Our deficit is now so small that our debt is falling as a share of GDP even though we continue to run a small deficit and we expect to be back in surplus in a few years. Our public pension system is one of the strongest in the world. And there is much more that has gone right for Canada. As David Cameron, the British Prime Minister, said when he was here two years ago, Canada seems to have gotten most things right. Among many others who have praised this new self-confidence in Canada was The Economist magazine in a cover story that many of you may recall from several years ago. But of course, we're not without our challenges. Despite the tremendous efforts of the 1990s to eliminate our deficits, reduce our debt, reform welfare, and, and repair the Canada pension plan, we still face challenges. We continue to have unemployment concentrated in a few regions and a few population groups, such as young people, recent immigrants, and aborigines. Our employment insurance system is still in need of reform, and if, uh, uh, when Sven's uh, finished talking about uh, health care, he may want to tell you something about how they run unemployment insurance, because it's sure different from the way we do. Uh, of course, the greatest entitlement program of them all, health care, remains more or less untouched by the massive public sector reforms of recent decades. So in search of reforms that might inspire us here in Canada, we're always looking for international examples that seem to fit in with our approach and our values. It's normal, therefore, that when we talk about reforming the welfare state or fixing health care, we inevitably think about the Swedish model. After all, Sweden is a wealthy northern democracy, rich in natural resources, with a long history of deep concern for issues of fairness and efficiency. And Sweden is increasingly being held up as an example of how to modernize the welfare state in all its aspects. Sean, you can go to the next slide. Unfortunately, we sometimes have an idealized view of what the Swedish model looks like. Uh, but if we were to have an intelligent discussion about the welfare state and the form of public health care within the welfare state, then it would be wise for us to look uh, to form a more accurate picture of what the real Swedish model looks like, warts and all, uh, which is, uh, again, what The Economist magazine did uh, in a very recent speaker today, uh, Sven Otto Litteren, knows what that model looks like. Uh, Sven served as the Secretary General for the Moderate Party in Sweden, where he helped to formulate that party's plans for welfare state re-engineering. Then when the Moderate Party formed a majority government in Sweden, he was given the chance as Minister of Employment to help put many of those reforms into effect. His party's government is the first ever Moderate Party government to be re-elected. Uh, he has over 20 years of experience in the public and the private sector. And I don't know exactly what Sven will uh, say to you, but if his views are like those of my other Swedish friends, he will say that he enjoys coming to Canada because it is like traveling back through a time war. <laughs> because we are having the very debates uh, today over health care reform in this country that Sweden was having 20 years ago. And they have resolved many of those debates in ways that may surprise you. Uh, so let me turn the floor over to our distinguished guest and my friend, Sven Amato Litter. So what about healthcare? I'm finally getting into the real issue. Well, um, given this background, obviously a universal uh, coverage system uh, is, is, I mean, it's a given. It has to be. Uh, it, it's just what people expect. If they pay taxes of that magnitude, they do expect deliverance, and they expect a high quality, universal care, and they want it to be good. And to be honest, who's doing what is of less importance. They just want it. And that's what, uh, from a political standpoint, we have to, to handle. Get people the best care they can, um, in time, uh, you know, as smooth as possible. Uh, good quality, of course. And accessibility, you know, we're, not as large as Canada size-wise, but we are fairly uh, uh, thinly spread out across uh, the country. And if you look to the north, for instance, uh, up north, it's really not as bad as Canada's north, I'm, I'm, I give you that. But you know, there are vast areas where few people live, and they also expect, because they pay the same taxes as everyone else, so they do expect the same kind of care uh, to the end of the day, although they might be able to accept that you have a bit further to travel to get to your 
uh, care facility and so forth. What about cost control then? Well, there are many things to say. Um, the difficult thing is, of course, that in any other system, uh, you can introduce um, schemes or uh, cost control measures that are obvious in a way. But this is a system, as you know, that where uh, the cost is driven by demand, um, where um, the demand is defined by someone who, uh, in one respect, should be cost unconscious. Uh, a doctor who'd say, well, this person needs this, this treatment or needs this and this and that. Now, how do you balance that? So how do you make sure that you have the right balance between what is actually provided and the cost that that um, incurs? And an overall sort of system that takes care on an aggregated level um, doesn't explode. Because obviously, if you could have an infinite demand of healthcare services. Um, and in the UK, as you know, which has no user fees and nothing like that, uh, I could just walk down to my little GP office down the corner and I could go there practically every day. I mean, I could spend my social life in his office. Uh, and the cost, of course, would be enormous uh, if I did that every day. Luckily, I didn't. So how do you handle that? Well, one thing that we uh, have had all along uh, is a user fee in the system. Uh, the user fee isn't all that much, and there's a cap and everything like that, but it does affect this primary care overuse uh, that we can see in systems which do not have user fees. There is a, a, a sort of a threshold. You know that if you go there, you do have to pay 100 kroners, which is what, uh, $15 or something like that. It's not much, but, but still it prevents this uh, part of this overuse of, of going to a healthcare facility instead of going to the library, if you know what I mean. Um, how is it organized? Well, very quickly, the central government uh, has uh, oversight of the overall healthcare policy uh, area. Uh, also have oversight over quali uh, you know, real quality control, uh, malpractice, things like that. Uh, has the, the ownership of the large insurance systems that are geared towards the individual, covering uh, 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 income loss and things like that. But then the county councils, which are our provinces, if you like, are responsible for the actual deliverance and, and financing of um, health care uh, in the country. They do have a large uh, share of freedom to act uh, within the system, which means that it looks quite differently in a way uh, from um, region to region. Um, there is a set of standards that are set by the central governments which they cannot go under, but they can specialize and they can be more flexible and they can sort of adopt to the circumstances that are unique to their environment which is quite good, because if you look to Stockholm, which is a, uh, you know, the, the Ottawa of Sweden, um, it's a densely populated area, lots of people live there, it's hectic and all of that. Uh, it's quite different from if you go up north, where there, there's not much happening, to be honest. So you can have that adoptability within the system if it's organized like that, I think. Uh, this used to be more or less um, a, a, a sort of a socialized part of the economy, if you like, used to be more or less only public sector providers and public sector operators within the system. That has, <clears throat> sorry, that has changed quite dramatically over the last 20, 30 years, I'd say, where in the 90s there was a, a, a purchaser provider split within these organizations, um, within the, the, the regional uh, governments, which was a way of separating five, oh gosh, yeah, this is the, the disadvantage of being a, a, a recovering politician. 30 minutes is like a sigh, you know, it's like a one breath of air. I'll try to get it in five minutes. Um, so there was this, this split between the purchasing uh, function and the providing function in order to get some sort of, of balance between the two within the system. And for the last 10, 15 years, I think, we've seen a very strong increase in, in private uh, suppliers within the system. And again, coming back to the fact that people aren't really necessarily interested in who is doing the services, as long as they get them. As long as they get them for a, a, you know, a fair sh a price and with good quality uh, uh, involved. Now, in primary care, about one third of the operators are private. Uh, in some areas, this varies, I'd say, say uh, very much from region to region of part of the country to part of the country. In, in Stockholm, it's about 60% who are private uh, operators within the system. 
The only thing is that they need to have um, a sort of a contract with the local government. Uh, but there is a freedom to establish for everyone who wants to establish as a free um, uh, entrepreneur within the, within the system. And there's very little, I mean, the, 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 what's demanded from the county council is basically that you, you have the quality requirements met and then you can, can be within the system. Uh, there's also, from the individual standpoint, a freedom to choose. So I choose the doctor I want within the system, uh, which is very, very good. And if I don't choose, I'll probably get the one that is closest to me phys physically where I live. Uh, most of these establishments are team-based. There's normally a set of four to six doctors, a, a gang of nurses and, and things like that, and you know where to go. Um, and it's, it's actually uh, not bad, to be honest. I, I really do feel that we get what we're paying for. There's a guarantee involved. It's called the 071990 guarantee, which means that zero wait for a consultation. Um, basically, you should be able to get it straight on. Um, a seven-day guarantee to visit a general uh, a GP. Um, I, you know, in the densely populated areas, you probably have the same day uh, service or next day service to meet a GP. Um, very few fall beyond the seven-day guarantee. Seven days is a long time uh, if you're waiting for a doctor. 90 days um, for consultation in specialized care and 90 days for treatment within that system is the guarantee. And it's actually... Uh, being met. So how do we handle um, queues, lines uh, within the system, waiting times? Well, I think it's a combination of um, a strong pressure from the central government. You do deliver on this. This is what we pay for. Uh, along with um, uh, user fee management, if I like, I, I, if, I, if I call it that, because I do think that that does play an effect. It is a hurdle that you have to pass to get into the system. Uh, and I think it's, it's probably wise to have something like that to sort of manage the flow of, of, of demand within the system. And I am coming down to the last part, so I promise. Um, <clears throat> when it comes to secondary care, hospitals and things like that, um, we have a mix. We have about seven uh, large regional university um, uh, operated, if you like, uh, hospitals, research hospitals, and then about 70 uh, county-wide hospitals. Uh, of which two-thirds are what we call acute care hospitals, open 24-7. Um, six of these are owned privately, and one of them is a, uh, 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 an acute care hospital 24-7. Uh, uh, there has been some discussions about it, but not all that much from a political standpoint, because, again, as long as you know, the deliverance and the quality is good, people really don't care who's doing the operations. Um, and that is good news, I think. Uh, overall performance is, is good. It's less expensive and performs better quality-wise than the Canadian system, as far as I've seen in the international comparisons. Why is that? I think that generally it's a de decentralized system, which is good because you can adopt to the differences between regions, and I think that's quite important. It is public sector guaranteed, if you like, but private operators have um, an opportunity to uh, establish, they have freedom to establish within the system, and the individual has the right to choose, and there is user fees to act as a sort of hurdle uh, in terms of trying to get some uh, cost control. Is everything okay then? Of course not. Uh, I think that as in any country, there's a constant discussion over quality, over cost, and the thing that we're all facing, uh, demographics. When people are getting older and older, uh, we are expecting and will need more and more care in our older days. And we all know that uh, the majority of care comes in the last 100 days of a, of a lifespan. Um, so if more and more people live longer, we have more people who are in those 100 last days uh, in, in one sense. So there is a definite, a, a big discussion on uh, how can we cope? Um, do we need to work longer? Um, how can we finance this over time and things like that? And I think that discussion will be uh, uh, increasing over the years to come. I think I've actually done my part so far and now